Hey guys, I'm Steve, also known as Terramantis, and recently I was invited by Gunfire Games, the developers behind Darksiders 3, to check out their new game, Remnant from the Ashes, a third-person shooter with inspiration pulled from all over the gaming spectrum, like randomized maps from Warframe or Diablo, solid gunplay, as well as melee combat and character progression similar to a Soulsborne title. As a matter of fact, many of the mechanics from Remnant from the Ashes are pulled straight from the Soulsborne genre. They just kind of take on different names and slightly different nuances. Take the Dragon Heart, for example, which is basically Remnant's version of an Estus Flask, a healing item with a specific amount of charges allotted until fully consumed, which is then recharged upon death or resting at a checkpoint. But unlike the Soulsborne series, Dragon Heart charges can also be used to pick up downed allies. Additionally, stamina regen is a major factor to mastering combat, and just like any respectable RPG, combat mechanics are influenced by player choice through equipment and stats. For equipment, Remnant has three armor slots, three trinket slots for rings and a necklace, one melee weapon, and two firearm slots. All of this when combined has a great influence on playstyle and how combat is approached. Trinkets have a variety of effects like increasing crit chance after defeating an enemy to healing close proximity allies when consuming a dragon heart and much more. And as one would expect, armor has stats for various damage resistances, but also has different set bonuses like treasure hunter for increased loot or challenger for increased damage to nearby enemies. Also akin to the Soulsborne genre, armor has weight, which affects roll speed. And roll speed is important when considering invincibility frames, aka iframes. Invincibility frames is the window during a roll animation at which the player can roll right through an enemy's attack to avoid damage. This is important because it has a great impact on melee combat. And speaking of which, melee combat in Remnant, mechanically, is pretty uniform from weapon to weapon. Each weapon type does have different movesets with various styles of vertical and horizontal strikes with varying attack speeds, reach, and damage output, but ultimately, each weapon has the same principle through specific button combinations. For instance, each weapon has a primary combo of three attacks in a row before restarting a combination, and attacks have two different versions, normal swings with a quick button tap, or charged harder hitting swings with a button press and hold. Normal and charged attacks can then be intermingled between for any and all attacks in the three hit combo string. There's also a unique lunging attack performed while sprinting, and finally, the neutral dodge which is performed by dodging without a direction can also be followed by an attack which skips to the last attack of the weapon's combo. In other words, if you're familiar with Soulsborne combat, dodging, iframes, melee, stamina management, etc., then you're going to feel right at home in Remnant. What's different though is Remnant obviously has guns, and the flow between firearms and melee combat happens pretty seamlessly. This is because in Remnant there is no firing guns from the hip. Firearms only shoot while aiming down the sights. Attempting to shoot without aim down sight will instantly switch to melee strikes so combat can flow effortlessly between short-range melee attacks and powerful firearms. Other than that though, gunplay of Remnant is pretty standard stuff. I'd say the most unique feature of Remnant's combat is probably its weapon mod system. And really though, at least in my experience, more often than not, these so-called weapon mods are not really weapon mods at all. They're actually castable abilities similar to spells, which can then be swapped in and out of any firearm with any empty slot. Then, during combat, when dealing damage with the modded gun, the ability will fill at a rate depending on the weapon's damage output. After enough damage is dealt and the ability icon fills, the player can then activate the ability at their discretion. Mod abilities definitely bring the most character to your build to define a role or class. This is because mods range from abilities that might put a healing area on the floor, grow thorns on your body for a duration to return damage and become nearly unstaggerable, launch a spore pod that forces the attention of enemies to attack it, summons a floating darkness spewing skull or hatchet wielding undead oompa loompas and much more. Armor choice, weapon loadout, ability mods, and equipped trinkets are then honed one step further towards an overall customization through trait distribution. And traits are basically the game's stat point system. Some traits are very standard stats, like more HP or stamina, stamina recovery, and so on. That said, with over 30 different traits to discover, eventually they do become very specialized as you plan and unlock them by performing various feats, turning into things like quick hands for faster reloads, mother's blessing for range damage reduction, and many others. And when all of this comes together, I think you can have a good understanding to how potential skills, equipment, and stats can define different approaches to play. 
For instance, later during a three-player co-op session, I was equipped with a ground heal, a magnum to stagger enemies, as well as summoning little minions to help even the odds against larger groups of enemies. In other words, I was playing more of a support role than a damage role. And as you can see here, this group of enemies is primarily comprised of exploding, spear-throwing enemies and one hulking brute. It didn't take long for me to realize that the brute needs to be brought down last. Otherwise, our group will be dealing with a barrage of exploding spears if we're only chipping away at this aggressive, hard-hitting berserker with a very deep health pool. So I use my magnum to interrupt and stagger enemies for crowd control instead of going for kills and then begin summoning minions to help divide the enemy group's focus away from my teammates. And with over 100 different enemy types, from irradiated exploding aliens to trans-dimensional tree creatures that can bust one shot, dynamic combat situations like this one can be found often. That said, the game's main combat situations, at least from what I experienced, have two major milestones. Horde-like standoffs against waves of enemies and boss encounters. Speaking of which, Boss encounters are definitely one of Remnant's strongest features. The Dragon World boss, for example, would spray fire across the battlefield, smashing and impacting with the destructible environment, whittling away at any potential safety and cover as the fight goes on. All the while, patches of oil on the ground can ignite into damaging status effect hazards, all culminating in an almost claustrophobic mechanic as the battle arena grows smaller and smaller from the dragon's attacks. But. If and when you do finally take some of these bosses down, they obviously drop some of the most sought after mods, traits, weapons, and crafting materials in the game. With that said, in Remnant, waves of color-coded loot don't drop all over the map. Instead, the majority of pickups are scrap, acting as currency, and crafting materials like iron and other more rare materials. These are then brought to your home base to reinforce armor, upgrade weapons, and craft new mods and weapons as well. However, these pieces of armor, weapons, and mods are mostly unlocked from defeating bosses or found out in the world. And how you find different mods, gear, crafting materials, and boss weapons is highly influenced by world design. This is because even though each of the four zones are all structured with the same overall idea of exploring to find a mid-boss and then completing the zone after a world boss, with some events, encounters, and environmental set pieces which are not randomized in the campaign along the way, the individual stage design of Remnant is structured somewhat like a Diablo game, with procedurally generated maps that are always changing the map's layout and configuration. And more to the point of before, this randomness can influence a map as to deliver alternate mid-bosses or final bosses of a zone, potentially altering the material or item that you're seeking. Trying to farm and upgrade Spitfire, the unique submachine gun flamethrower hybrid crafted with materials from the Dragon World boss of the first zone? Well, the dragon might not even be there. Instead, it could be the enormous Treant World boss with a different loot table altogether. And the randomness doesn't stop there. These bosses can even have different modifiers changing behaviors of the fight. Gorefist, for example, in one of my encounters had Regenerator, which constantly healed the mid-boss over time, and in a different encounter had Hardy, making it extremely resilient to damage. Further still, randomization can also change events, move item locations as well as the actual item found at that location, and it can move or remove encountered NPCs from one visit to the next. Meaning return visits to the same zone can yield completely different results from player to player and from one playthrough to the next. I played Remnant for about 8 hours, fought 6 different bosses, and finished 2 of the 4 zones in that time. Which means if progression happens at a similar rate throughout the game, then it's roughly 15 to 20 hours. With that said though, from alternating world bosses for each zone as well as mini bosses with changing modifiers, to randomized NPC encounters, puzzles, unique item spawns, and events found on each map, the game is definitely designed so that you cannot experience everything it has to offer in a single playthrough. So with the right support, Remnant from the Ashes could be a game people play consistently for years instead of weeks. And luckily then, Gunfire Games is off to a good start, promising an adventure mode as a new addition to the game two weeks after its launch on August 20th. Alright guys, that's about it from me. Let me know if you have any questions about Remnant from the Ashes in the comment section below. I'll do my best to answer anything I can. And if you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button. It goes a long way with the success and searchability of videos. It helped me out a lot and I'd really appreciate it. And last but not least, I'd like to thank Perfect World for sponsoring this video. And if you're interested in the game, there's a link in the description box below that will take you to all things Remnant from the Ashes. Alright, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.